General George S. Patton's battle-hardened heroes of the Third Army are blasting their way through a deadly maze of barbed wire, concrete, and steel. The hell for leather charge across Europe is over. And now, Patton's warriors are going up against the centuries-old fortress city of Metz and the underground monster known as Fort Driant. General George S. Patton. His bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard-fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II. On this 360-degree battlefield, Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, Siege Warfare. Fall 1944. Hitler's empire is fighting to survive, squeezed on all sides by Allied forces. But in the Lorraine, his soldiers have slowed General George S. Patton's advance towards Germany in eastern France. Now, Patton's Third Army has stalled out, brought to a halt by terrible weather, a shortage of supplies, and enemy firepower. This is the worst for Patton, to be stuck in the rain and the mud, not enough supplies to fight. This is not the kind of war Patton wants. He's getting frustrated. He's not getting what he wants. He's not seeing results that he would like to see on the battlefield. September 27, 1944. American P-47s, under the command of General Jimmy Doolittle, nail a major obstacle outside of Metz, known as Fort Driant, codenamed Operation Thunderbolt. The air campaign is all part of Patton's plan to clear the way to the vital city of Metz. The mission to take Fort Driant has fallen on the shoulders of Patton's 20th Corps under Major General Walton H. Walker. Walton Walker was Patton's bulldog, as he was known during World War II. He was an armor officer, uh, very loyal to Patton, very creative, uh, very aggressive commander. It would kind of give the same salty speeches that Patton gave. It was because of that reputation and that talent that Patton ultimately would refer to him as the fightinest son of a bitch I have. The first assault on Fort Driant begins with a massive bombardment. Once the warplanes have plastered the fort with bombs, Walker plans to clear it out with a combined ground attack by a thousand riflemen, tankers, and engineers. Two miles away, heavy field artillery unleashes a steady stream of shell fire. The riflemen of the 5th Infantry Division watch and wait. In a matter of minutes, they'll enter the killing grounds of Fort Driant. Flashback, August 1944. After breaking out from the Norman hedgerows, General George S. Patton, a.k.a. Old Blood and Guts, raced across France, grabbing headlines and raising hell for the Nazis. But with gas and ordnance in short supply and heavy rain setting in, Patton's drive grinds to a halt, giving German forces a chance to regroup. We had rain coming out our ears. Rain and mud, and our tanks would get caught. I was so tired of rain and snow and cold and wet, and wishing I want to go home. But the war wasn't over. The war has changed from a war of maneuver to basically a boxing match. We are away from these grand sweeping maneuvers and we're looking at static warfare. In the south, elements of Patton's army have made some progress on the right flank. Some units have advanced past the Moselle, 
But even here, progress has slowed to a crawl. In the north, the campaigning has turned into a horrific stalemate. Tanks and infantry soldiers find themselves facing determined resistance as they move in on the medieval city of Metz. Located at the confluence of the Moselle and Say rivers, Metz was born for warfare. Nearly impenetrable, it's held out against foreign invaders for hundreds of years. And since the 1870s, rival French and German forces have been turning Metz into a fortress. The capture of the city of Metz became necessary um, because as Patton's Third Army moved through the area roughly between the cities of Thionville and Epinal in the Lorraine area of France, as they moved through that flat area, they needed the flatland so that they could advance out of Lorraine and into the Saar district of western Germany. Strategy seized the fortress city and the vital roadways in order to advance into Germany. Tactics use infantry supported by tanks and artillery to overwhelm the city's outer defenses and take Metz with a full frontal assault. has become a linchpin in Hitler's defensive strategy, and he's handpicked General Hermann Balk to hold the line. Balk was a favorite of Adolf Hitler. Balk was a commander who had fought and done miraculous things on the Eastern Front. He was an excellent tank commander, and he was considered one of the best in the German army. Balk knows his forces can't beat Patton in a war of maneuver, and has no intention of fighting on Patton's terms. Instead, he orders General Heinrich Keitel to dig in and slow Patton's drive to the Rhine. To do that was to spare Germany um, one more day of the ravages of war that were surely coming, which is why the fighting around Metz assumes this desperate quality. Balk has a major ace up his sleeve the deadly network of forts guarding the city. Mostly underground, they're made of steel and concrete and nearly impossible for the Americans to spot. They can dish out a lethal dose of killing power from heavy artillery that can cover a wide area, allowing each fort to protect another in the defensive chain. The most dangerous enemy stronghold is Fort Triant, a massive subterranean complex of concrete bunkers, underground tunnels, and pillboxes protected by reinforced concrete, seven feet thick at its weakest spot. Driant is more than 1,000 yards wide, protected by at least five batteries of heavy 100 and 150 millimeter siege guns, and a score of automatic weapons. 200 yards out from the central complex, Driant is surrounded by a moat 30 feet deep and 20 yards wide, perfect for stopping an American tank dead in its tracks. You know, firepower would have limited effect. I mean, you know, large bombs were direct hits on, on this fort, and, and, uh, but really didn't affect the ability of the defenders to continue to fire artillery and machine guns and so forth from those positions. Manning the fort are 1,500 Nazi cadets and landlocked sailors, all of them ready to hold out to the very end. Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Lemon from the 5th Infantry Division already felt the fort's wrath while trying to lead his men across the Moselle in early September. We had to stop and say, hell, oh, we're not trained for this. Let's take a time out. We went up to Luxembourg and trained on the Maginot Line to attack fortified positions. Lemon handpicks the largest abandoned casemate he can find, then has the engineers hit the concrete walls with every type of explosive in their arsenal. And we really 
really wrecked it. Well, they had to bring the troops up and show them what the munitions did, which was good. It gave them confidence, a little more confidence in their weapons. Unfortunately, just as his men prepare for their mission, Lemon is taken off the front lines and sent to Washington, D.C. Lemon's soldiers will have to take on Fort Drian without him. Using what little intelligence he has on Drian, Patton has decided the concrete megafort is one of the keys to capturing the city and orders an immediate assault. But despite a heavy pounding, the Germans are unscathed and easily repel the 1,000-man ground attack. Now today, we would take out those forts with precision weaponry that allows bombs and other types of, of munitions to penetrate the steel and reinforced concrete of those bunkers and explode inside. We have bunker buster bombs specifically designed for this, for this kind of role. Patton decides to send an even bigger ground force to wipe out the German fort, adding an entire regiment to the assault and more tanks. The attack now totals about 3,300 soldiers. October 3, 1944, a tank company from the 735th Battalion rolls into position for an assault on Fort Triad. Among the fighters of the 735th is Frank Chambers of Indiana. We were supposed to have air, we didn't get any. And that might have helped, but I doubt it. Because a 500 pound bomb dropped on one of those places, didn't even open them up. The assault plan against Riant calls for a strike against two vital points. One force of tanks and infantry will hit the fort from the southwest, while another force will attack from the northwest. Battle of Fort Driant begins. Under a shower of American ordnance, the assault teams swarm towards the fort. Heading into a fight they will never forget. General George S. Patton's Third Army is facing one of its toughest challenges in October 1944, seizing the fortified French city of Metz on the rain-swollen Moselle River. Patton has underestimated his opponent, Hermann Balk, and his strategy of digging in. Using a series of World War I-era concrete forts, Balk is keeping Patton at bay. The fighting has turned into a deadly siege. The kind of static battle Patton hates. He really didn't have an idea of what was in front of him. Uh, he didn't have the maps for it. He didn't have the aerial photography because of bad weather. So he was kind of punching blind. And it's going to affect him. It's going to affect his core and the fighting soldiers on the ground. Right now, the combat is centered on Fort Triant, the strongest of a chain of forts blocking the road to the French city of Metz. For days, the men of General Stafford Irwin's 5th Infantry Division have been trying to take the underground complex, but so far, the Germans have easily repelled every attack. October 3rd, 1944. American howitzers send a volley of steel crashing into the fort now, Patton's infantrymen and tanks prepare to assault Triant and claim it once and for all. One of the men tasked with hitting Driant is Andy McGlynn of the 2nd Battalion, 11th Regiment. Recently promoted to squad leader, McGlynn is leading replacements fresh out of boot camp into the fight. The replacements are scared to death because the rumor was if you get transferred to an infantry outfit, that's like signing your own death warrant. We got the order to go after Fort Riant, and those poor guys were so afraid. I didn't blame them. Hell, I was afraid too. Backing up the foot soldiers are the tanks of the 735th Battalion. 
11 of the Shermans headed into battle are armed with an improved 76 millimeter main gun. By late 1944, many of the weaker 75 millimeter tank guns are being switched out. The newer 76 millimeter gun weighs in at 1,200 pounds. It has a muzzle velocity of 2,800 feet per second and can fire a three inch projectile at a maximum range of eight miles. As heavy mortar and cannon shells slam on top of Driant, Patton's attack kicks off. Armored vehicles and infantrymen surge across the open ground and storm the citadel. I never thought I'd be killed, never. I wanted to get a nice wound, broken bone or something like that, but you be careful what you wish for. As the 735th Tank Battalion moves toward the outer defenses, Patton's tankers attempt to use explosive snakes to bust through the barbed wire entanglements and minefields. We pulled it up to the minefield. Then we got behind it. The idea was to push it out into the minefield and explode it. Well, did you ever try to push a wet noodle? It didn't work. It didn't work at all. It just kept turning around this way, turning around that way. And they never did work. 500 yards away, Andy McGlynn leads his rifle squad towards the deadly killing grounds outside the fort. And I came to this field and I looked up in a corner and uh, I could see two bodies, two GIs, bodies up there. Below their waist, it's all blood. And I figured, holy hell, I'm in a minefield. So I got the guys and we moved around and we found a tank track. We followed the track of the tank on up toward what we thought was a fort. Despite the failure of the explosive snakes, tank fire rips up the razor sharp thickets of barbed wire. Then the 76 millimeter Shermans open up on the fort's blockhouses and pillboxes. You really couldn't get the tanks in where the people were. And the people were all underground. And the tanks wouldn't go underground. So all we could do was sit up on top and shoot. So it made it tough on the infantry because they had to do it all themselves. The firepower on the tanks were not sufficient to really penetrate these fortifications. And then to get a direct fire, which is right from your tank gun to the fortress shot. So these are very courageous men who are going there to support their infantry. 30 yards away, The massive casements of Fort Triant absorbed the shock of the shells fired at them. Well, nothing happened. <laughs> this would have, they, in fact, they even took a 155 rifle, which is a big gun, with it, and, and fired point blank, and it just chipped a little of the concrete off. Those walls are eight feet thick. Some troops got into the underground areas of the fort. They didn't get too far. Um, others were involved in dropping grenades down to air vents. It's a different type of warfare. Makes you think back to World War I. It was bloody, it was lethal. It was close hand-to-hand -hand combat in some cases. The Germans, of course, would use interconnecting trenches to move from one fortification to the next. So they had the advantage, and the Americans paid for that advantage in blood. German defenders inside the fort also have another advantage. Their heavy artillery is protected by armored domes, similar to the gun turrets on a battleship. The domes are placed on the tops of reinforced concrete blockhouses that the attacking Americans can't even see. Inside, artillerymen can load and fire the guns, while underneath, a system of hand cranks rotates the dome into firing position. The battle for the fort is simply murder. And we couldn't get down in the underground passageways. And of course, that's what the infantry was trying to do, you know, and they left a lot of people down there. Andy McGlynn leads a fire team towards one of Driant's outer pillboxes. And 
I stuck my head over the door, I could hear Germans talking. And I got up to that door, and I was reaching out with my left hand when this guy shot me right through here, up the wrist. Thinking he's been killed, McGlynn's comrades beat a hasty retreat. Now, Andy McGlynn is on his own. 500 yards away, the armored assault against Triant has failed. Hidden German artillery has knocked out five tanks. And as night falls over the battlefield, enemy shells arc in from other readouts throughout the sector. For Patton's soldiers in the 5th Infantry Division, the nightmare at Fort Triad has only just begun. For the men of the 5th Infantry Division in Patton's 3rd Army, hell on earth is a place called Fort Driad. Fort Driad, that is one tough place to take. I mean, it's fortified, it's got guns in the right place. I mean, that is a serious objective that they're looking at. For over a month, Patton has been stuck in the rain-soaked Lorraine region of eastern France. His fuel and artillery supplies are draining. His forces are unable to make any rapid advance. Patton is frustrated. And even with his army out of gas, he still has to take on the imposing city of Metz and its string of protective forts before he can advance to Germany. Back inside the fort, the 5th Division is still slugging it out. The Germans defending it are fanatical NCO graduates. They are charging out of their defenses, firing their machine guns, screaming, Heil Hitler basically making the American soldiers' blood run cold. As the battle rages nearby, squad leader Andy McGlynn lies in a growing pool of his own blood, and a German soldier is watching his every move. Then I thought, I better get a run for it. So I tried to raise my head. I tried to move my hands, and I found out I could hardly do that. And I thought, I'm bleeding to death. And I groaned. The German right away, fascist, fascist us. And I turned, I said, I'm wounded, I'm wounded. Come and see, come and see. And two guys reached over and got me over the door, took me back in, oh God. McGlynn is led into the depths of the German bunker, which turns out to be one of Fort Triant's main barracks. They had rooms with bunks in, they had kitchen down there, they had a room with some kind of an air compressor to bring fresh air in. They got me in this room full with Germans, and they uh, didn't have anybody there to speak English. They tried to ask me questions, and one German, he saw my hand was a mess. McGlynn is stripped of his gear and escorted behind enemy lines. For now, the war is over for Andy McGlynn. Throughout the night, the Americans hold their positions and fend off waves of enemy counterattacks. Frank Chambers and his crew have pushed their Sherman as far as they can, stopped cold by a 30-foot deep tank trap. I fired my 76 and both machine guns all night long. And down to the left of me, maybe 50 feet, the guys down there from B Company ran out of ammunition. And they captured them. They kept coming, and we kept shooting. And our 30 caliber the barrel got red hot, and then it got white hot, and then it got blue hot. And then we changed barrels and started it over again. At the same time, a barrage of enemy shells pour onto the Americans from other nearby German forts. The 
first night we got hit by what was probably a 155 artillery shell. Blew all everything off our back deck of our tank, which is where all our rations were. Fighting at Fort Triant rages on for days. Finally, on October 13th, the assault is called off. Nearly 500 Americans have perished. Now, Patton is faced with seriously reconsidering his own trademark fighting style. Oh, it had to have been immensely frustrating. This is the great American master of battle in the Second World War. And suddenly, he no longer has this ability to fight his army in a manner consistent with his bravado, which was attack, attack, attack. Throughout World War II, Patton had never retreated. But at Fort Driant, the enemy caused him to pause and pull back. So technically, you could say that Fort Driant was Patton's biggest defeat during World War II. If Patton's going to take on Metz and the forces under Hermann Balk, he'll have to come up with a new strategy. He simply cannot pull off the kind of maneuvers that made him famous in the battles across France. And hitting Fort Drian head on is taking a heavy toll on his infantry. With the fight for Drian called off, Third Army enters a quiet pause on the front lines. During the lull in battle, fresh combat outfits join the ranks of Third Army. One of them is the 761st Tank Battalion. And this battalion has the distinction of being an all African American tank battalion. They enter battle as a part of a segregated army in a segregated unit where they have black NCOs and junior officers, white senior officers. One of the tankers in the 761st is William McBurney of New York City. I was born and raised down in Hell's Kitchen of New York City and then moved uptown. Then uh, the war started and I joined the army. I wanted to go in as a pilot, but at the time, they didn't have uh, blacks in aviation. Unable to get his pilot's wings, McBurney joins the 761st in the training grounds of Louisiana. But when the 761st arrives in France, Patton is not impressed. In his memoirs, Patton noted, individually, they were good soldiers, but I expressed my belief that a colored soldier cannot think fast enough to fight in armor. Now, as the Black Panthers of the 761st Tank Battalion prepare to head into battle against the Nazis, they're honor bound to prove their commander wrong. When he was talking to me, you know, in my mind, I, I said, on you, uh, we're gonna prove it. I'm gonna prove it. Not we, but I, I as a person. And that, that, that's it. On a daily basis, other soldiers fresh from replacement depots join manpower starved veteran units in Patton's army. One of them is Arnold Whitaker of Lansing, Michigan. I was six foot one, 174 pounds played football, and they thought, well, this is a good guy to be an infantryman. So I think I was a part of a maybe 260 replacements that joined the 5th. Another unit joining the fight is the untested 95th Infantry Division. Serving as a combat scout in the 95th is Edwin Kalaji of New Jersey. Kalaji quickly receives his own baptism of fire during a mission behind enemy lines in the town of Vaison. The next day, he has a chance run-in with old blood and guts himself when Patton personally decorates the scouts with combat infantrymen's badges. They came up, he said to me, honey, how many of them did you kill? And I said, well, I was told they carried 30 out of there. And he said, well, that's that many, the bastards won't reproduce. And that was George Patton. But for the men of the 95th, the firefight at Vaison is nothing compared to the true test they're about to face. Resupplied with fuel and ammunition, Patton is hungry for action. The ultimate battle for Metz is about to begin.
October 1944, General George S. Patton's Third Army is preparing for a massive offensive, bent on breaking the German resistance at Metz and pushing hard on the German border. Patton's army has been tied down in the Lorraine for months, so close to the enemy homeland that they can almost taste it. Until now, Patton has played right into the hands of the enemy, attempting a series of headlong assaults against the forts that defend the city of Metz. Patton has underestimated the Germans. The Germans had really established a very strong defense along the Moselle, Moselle River and around Metz in particular. German General Hermann Balk knows there's no chance of defeating Patton, but he's done a great job of slowing him down. Leading Patton's regiment and division-sized attacks in places like Fort Driant and in house-to-house -house street fights in the town of Maizer le Metz. Metz is such a lengthy campaign that there are debates in the beginning of November about changing the strategy of how to take it. What Patton realizes is they are able to make some progress north and south and that a pincher movement is the best way to take it instead of the original frontal assault that they had planned. While General Mattinetti's 12th Corps fights its way up the Saar River Valley from the south towards the Rhine, Patton directs General Walker's 20th Corps to resume the attack on Metz. Instead of a frontal assault, Walker's men will encircle Metz and cut off the German defenders. With his ranks swelling with manpower and supplies, Patton can finally unleash an attack, combining firepower and maneuver. On November 8, 1944, you see within Third Army, you see kind of this new offensive. And it's with this thought and this recognition that it would continue momentum toward the Rhine River. But even as Patton's army prepares for what they hope to be the final battle for the Lorraine, the day-to-day -day suffering of the common soldier continues as the temperatures start to drop. We just survived. And it was, it was miserable. And we slept inside the tank when they were shelling and used our helmet for everything. The steel helmet was our house, as you would say. Our kitchen, our house, we'd cook with it, we'd wash up with it. We learned to survive with just the helmet itself. But almost worse than the weather and the enemy shelling, keeping connected to the people they've left behind is difficult for Patton's soldiers. We do have a custom, though, we did in that day. That uh, I don't know if they have it today or not, but in those days, when, uh, when a guy loved a gal, uh, a lot of times we would get a lock of hair, just a kind of a thing between us. And I had a lock of Lucille's hair. And one day she sent me in one of those letters uh, the imprint of her lips with lipstick on it. And I wrapped that around the lock of hair and I carried it. And I carry that to this day. I still carry it. 65 years. A little lock of hair. And a reminder that she still loves me. November 8th, 1944. The battle for Metz begins. Three infantry divisions with armored units in support close in and surround the city. The veterans of the 90th Division, AKA the Tough Hombres, will move in from the north. The 5th Division will come from the south. And the 95th Infantry Division, including Ed Kalaji, will make a headlong assault from the center. But the big guns at Fort Triad aren't making it easy. They used the artillery in that fort to harass the Americans struggling to capture the city of Metz. So it's not as if Fort de Lyon just went away. It continued to be a problem. The battle outside of Metz rages for nearly a week on both sides of the Moselle. 
poorly trained German reserves fight like hell beside their Nazi comrades, doing all they can to hold off the Third Army. As much as Patton's troops are trying to avoid the German forts, one company from the 95th Infantry Division enters the crosshairs of machine guns near Fort Jean d'Arc. The combat scouts, including Ed Kalaji and Sergeant Melvin Grendel, are called in to help. When he got there, we found there was a trench that surrounded his bunker, which must have been 75 feet long and solid concrete. Kalaji and Grendel settle in for a horrific night on the front lines outside of Metz. The following day, heavy German artillery begins to pour in. Two miles away, the big guns of Fort Driant send out a steady barrage of iron, keeping the men of the 95th pinned down at Jean d'Arc for two days. As the combat scouts of the 95th weather the storm of fire, one thing is certain, it's only a matter of time before the entire unit is wiped out. Machine gunners Kalaji and Grindle are about to do the unthinkable. And it just might save their comrades. November 1944. After bashing his head against the formidable defenses guarding Metz, Patton has revised his strategy and is attempting to encircle the city. Patton spent his birthday, November 11th, as he liked to say, getting where the bodies are still warm. Even though it was his birthday, he was still visiting the front, keeping an eye on his men, and taking a tally of German casualties. Right now, a violent bunker-to-bunker -bunker fight is playing out near Fort Jean d'Arc. Just didn't appear to be any way out of there at all. And Grondel and I decided, what the hell, if we're going to die anyway, let's, let's give him a shot before we die. We then commenced firing. We caught them with the firing ports open, and we could hear some screaming coming from there. Apparently, those bullets getting in, ricocheting around all the concrete walls in there scared the hell out of them. An eerie silence passes over the battleground. Suddenly, a German medic pops out of the door, waving a white flag. And he was shouting, surrender, surrender. An SS officer and 40 men come out with their hands up. walked down into the front of the bunker and put the hand grenade in the German officer's belly and put the 45 in his back. And I said, now, if this is some sort of a trick, if I go, you go, because I'll blow you to hell. His response to me was, no need to talk that way, sir. I speak English clearly. I understand you have it surrounded. I'm surrendering my 40 men to you. Thinking he's been surrounded by an entire company, the SS officer is more than a little surprised to be taken prisoner by only two machine gunners. By November 22nd, organized enemy resistance begins to collapse. American units enter Metz, moving street to street, house to house, clearing out any German holdouts. We always watched out for the church steeples, because that's where they would put their best snipers. With an M1, you, you can't do a lot, but we'd get the tankers in there, or, or we'd have our bazooka man put a round in the church steeple. German General Hermann Balk orders a massive withdrawal, informing General Heinrich Keitel, commanding the city, that he's on his own. As the Germans fall back, their comrades, the survivors of Fort Triant and Jean d'Arc, beg to be relieved, but instead, they are abandoned.
November 25, 1944, the battle for Metz is over. Patton's army controls the city. That was the last strong point that was preventing the US Third Army from moving swiftly through Lorraine, crossing the border, and entering the Fatherland. There's nothing holding Patton back. He can advance directly to the border. In two months of combat in the Lorraine, from Dorno to Aracor and Metz, Patton's Third Army has suffered more than 55,000 men killed, wounded, and missing. The 5th Division alone has lost 800 men in the failed attacks on Fort Driant. Among the casualties from Fort Driant is Andy McGlynn. Now, McGlynn and hundreds like him are escorted to a series of prison camps east of the Rhine River. I'm alive. You know, that was the main thing. I'm still alive. I didn't know whether I was ever going to go home. But I am alive, and you take each day as it comes. Patton is quick to recognize the sacrifice of his soldiers, telling one wounded GI, tomorrow, son, the headlines will read, Patton took Mets, which you know is a goddamn lie. You and your buddies are the ones that actually took Mets. The men of the 95th Infantry Division have proven themselves, winning not only the respect of their comrades, but that of the enemy. A German general who was in charge of defending Metz said that the 95th were iron men, and that's where the iron men of Metz came from. For their heroic action in silencing the enemy pillbox near Jean d'Arc, Kalaji and Sergeant Grendel both received the Silver Star for gallantry. I'm proud of the Iron Men of Metz. I guess I'm grateful that I lived through being one of them. I'm proud of all the guys that fought and all the guys that died. As Walker's Corps celebrates its victory over Metz, the fighting continues in the Saar River Valley. In the face of heavy combat, the African-American tankers of the 761st Battalion forge a reputation, proving themselves to their fellow tankers. You know, as far as I'm concerned, they were disciplined, they were ready to go. I'd fight by him tomorrow. The camaraderie between ourselves at night after all the fighting, I think that's what held us together, because we were really tight as a unit, as, as, as friends. And it hurt when uh, we lost one another. Though Patton and many Allied generals think the war might still be over by Christmas, Adolf Hitler is secretly planning to show them that they're dead wrong. As the temperatures drop, Hitler plans a massive assault that none of the Allied brass could possibly predict. In a matter of days, the tankers of the veteran 4th Armored and every GI in Patton's army will enter the frozen hell of the Ardennes Forest. The Lorraine campaign may finally be over, but the Battle of the Bulge is about to begin.